their influential leaders. Welcome to a very special episode of The Influential Executive. We are thrilled that we had the pleasure of interviewing the one and only Peter Zenge. Some people regard Peter as the world's number one expert in the field of leadership and knowledge management. Peter is an American system scientist who is a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management, co-faculty at the New England Complex Systems Institute, and the founder of the Society for Organizational Learning. He is best known for his book, The Fifth Discipline, which is a groundbreaking piece of work in the field of organizational learning. Peter doesn't do social media because he finds that he creates the most value by focusing on his work. So if you spend most of your time on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, you may not have heard of Peter yet, and that is about to change right now. Do you want to build a company that survives and thrives not just for now, but for the decades to come? Then you came to the right place. <laughs> this podcast is sponsored by Earn More, Work Less. We founded this management coaching organization hmm, approximately one and a half years ago to create stress-free leaders. Because when we are dedicated to create a better world for ourselves and the future generations, we need leaders who are stress-free so that they can think clearly and make great decisions for everyone involved. The new generation of leaders have an open mind, think from the inside out and understand the value of teamwork. And most importantly, they are aware of the fact that they are part of a bigger system. What does that mean, that we're part of a bigger system? That's what Peter Senge will explain right here in this interview. Prepare to spend an hour with one of the greatest minds in today's business world, Peter Senge. Today we welcome Peter Senge to our podcast, The Influential Executive. Peter, thank you for sharing an hour of your time and a lifetime of wisdom with us today. Very welcome. We're very excited to be interviewing you. Um, you are a systems scientist and you're active at MIT Sloan School of Management. Can I say that this is the number one management school in the world? Well, I'm sure that's a claim many people would make. <laughs> so yes, of course you can say it. <laughs> I remember this name very clearly from when I studied business in Rotterdam at the Rotterdam School of Management. Yep. I remember the name MIT was all over yeah. these papers that they asked us to read. And I was extremely excited to hear that you are available for an interview with us. You are one of the greatest leadership thinkers of modern time. So that makes it extremely exciting. And on the other hand, you weren't you aren't that widely known. I saw, for example, that on Twitter, you have almost <laughs> 7,000 followers and you haven't even tweeted one single time. So somehow people must be dying to hear your opinion on things. <laughs> yep, that's accurate. Is it a conscious choice for you to do not that much of social media and personal branding and possibly focus your time and energy in a different field? That's absolutely right. Yeah, I, I'm very skeptical of uh, how everybody manage, tries to manage appearances these days. It's uh, kind of an evolution over a few generations and been accelerated a lot by the social media, which I think is a, are a very big problem in the world today. What is the problem that social media creates exactly? Well, no, no big things other than people no longer connect to or make any effort to understand the truth. They're much more interested in their opinions. Appearance replaces substance. It's kind of one of the oldest dilemmas in human relationships. You know, it's what you say, how you look. People are busy managing the appearance of everything, but below the surface, there's not much. Often, and very often, very often what's below the surface is quite contradictory to what the pictures you try to paint on the surface. But probably there's no more immediate problem that we see everywhere than the extraordinary uh, 
disillusion of any societal commitment to understand what's actually going on versus what I say is going on. And of course, we all have our versions in our different countries of the uh, political shift in the wind that, you know, the fake news, you know, it's what I say is what is. Um, we had a very wonderful, really thought-provoking talk at MIT just two weeks ago by a good friend of mine, an old friend uh, named Michael Hayden, H-A-Y-D-E-N. Um, he's the only person in the history of the United States who's been both the director of the uh, NSA and the CIA. And he's recently published a book, you know, how do countries uh, make intelligence in a world of lies? And without doubt, the main contributor to that dynamic is social media. So if, if I say it's true, it's true. So, that, you know, we all know that reality is not as simple as, you know, this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, he, he framed all of it. And he said, you know, our ed educational institutions, ultimately our media, at least in an ideal sense, certainly our intelligence institutions are all kind of, he framed them as, a, you know, products of the Enlightenment era. The, you know, the, the, the changes in, in our Western Eurocentric cultures three or 400 years ago in this quest to understand a reality that in some sense is consensual. Uh, again, not the reality, but to better understand what's going on. And he said that's deteriorating very rapidly in, in the world today, and particularly in the Western world, uh, as uh, a product of the undermining of our education systems combined with the effects of social media. So yeah, I have some real problems with social media. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So basically, and what, what I found with social media is that we are often getting caught up in a lot of chatter and thereby being distracted from a search for the truth. Exactly, exactly. And we all know, again, it's not the truth with a capital T, but a, a conviction if you go about it in a sensible way. And of course, all of our Western science is, is predicated on the same assumptions. Gradually, over time, you discover more and more what's not accurate. And you gradually, at least this is the ideal, right? get closer and closer to what is accurate without ever getting 100% of the way. So those are kind of cornerstones, I, cornerstone ideas of our civilization, really. Uh, Mike had a very, uh, Mike Hayden had a very interesting kind of comment. He said, my 50 years in, uh, in national intelligence has taught me that the veneer of civilization is very thin. And I think that's literally what's at risk right now. <laughs> Exactly. And you are also the, the founder of the Society for Organizational Learning. How does that play into the observation that you just described? Well, and another way to describe what I just said is that's what all learning is about. Learning is really kind of two dimensions, really, if you start off just thinking about it personally. It's how I develop capacities, you know, how I learn to walk, how I learn to talk, how I learn to be more effective in my relationships, et cetera. It's a lifelong journey of developing the abilities to do things that you previously couldn't do. That's kind of what learning is. But there's another dimension of learning which has to do with perception and awareness and understanding. And over time, do I develop more of an understanding of the complexities of social relations. So it's, let's just put it in a business context. Do I develop more of an understanding of what it takes to build an effective team, um, which is very relational, of course. Um, so um, I think learning always has these two dimensions and the, the, the problems with social media right now, the most obvious ones have to do with the second dimension, which is how we understand a little more fully or a little more accurately what's going on around us, how we connect more do, more accurately with the reality of our situation. Um, so yes, it has a lot to do with learning. And, and talking about learning, uh, I was surprised and amazed by your learning curve. Namely, you studied aerospace engineering, philosophy, social systems modeling and management. So I would be curious to hear how did you decide from the beginning until, let's say, the management, um, management studies, how did you make the decisions about what are you going to study? Well, in, those are more categories. Uh, in, in fact, my interest has always been the same 
and it's just you know different places to uh, to move towards or different things to pay attention to in the journey. I've always been interested in the same thing, and that is that the world we live in today is extraordinarily interconnected, <laughs> extraordinarily complex, but we don't understand that complexity. It's, it's way beyond our education system. We're not prepared for it. And, you know, a classic example of this would be climate change. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's really quite a profound paradox, a tragic paradox that around the world, more and more, even in my country, people are gradually coming to agree that, yep, human influence, climate change is going on. And two, it's very likely to have a huge and adverse impact on our kids and our, our kids' kids. And yet, we do almost nothing. It's, it's really the sign of the times, this profound sense of fatalism that the biggest issues in the world are beyond our reach. And in turn, we kind of amuse ourselves with the latest mm-hmm. technology and <laughs> it's like a giant uh, you know, habituation or, or you might almost say hypnotic state that we run around playing with our gadgets while literally the world around us spurns up. You know, those old things. I remember, you know, when as a kid, you know, we talked about Nero and the fall of Rome fiddling while Rome burned. Well, we're fiddling while the planet around us burns. And yet we seem to feel that there's nothing that can be done. So I think this is a a deep issue and it's the one I've always been interested in. I'm expressing it obviously now in terms that are real right now, but you know, 50 years ago, it was just very evident to me that uh, the world we lived in was extraordinarily interconnected and we by and large were blind to those interconnections. So that's been the journey. Uh, I studied engineering initially because there was rich theory and method around understanding systems in engineering. That led me eventually to graduate school at MIT, where I, within the first few months, found a mentor who I worked with for a, a decade. His name is Jay Forrester, and he was developing a field which at MIT is called system dynamics, but it's about building complex, building computer simulation models of complex social uh, situations, hence the social modeling. And and then, since I was always interested, not just in the kind of philosophic challenges, but the practical, <laughs> uh, that kind of gradually got me oriented towards working with a relatively small group of, of businesses who were really waking up uh, to these needs to fundamentally shift the culture of business to being one Eventually, we use the term learning versus controlling, but initially, you know, how we develop the ability to understand more complex issues. Um, And and that ultimately, we realized, was a a very fundamental learning process, hence the whole emergence of the term learning organization, how do organizations continually enhance their capacities to make sense of and act effectively in an increasingly complex, interconnected, emergent, uncertain realities. So it really has been only one question the whole time. It's just been a journey of, you know, where were, where were the opportunities to pursue this question? Wow, that yeah. is that is a lifelong search. And as you say, the learning part is a, is a lifelong mission that's never ending. What mission are you on? What is your personal part in this bigger case, this bigger question? Well, the learning that's needed is individual and collective. That's the first thing that you have to realize. I mean, the term learning, we would most naturally use uh, in terms of individual, you know, like we learn how to walk, we learn how to talk, and you know, we, we learn a lot of things in our lives. But the learning that's really needed today is collective as well as individual, and collective at the level of teams and organizations, but really at the level of industries and societies in the world. And again, I just take climate change as, as a classic example, it is a profound learning challenge. The countries, the nation states of the world simply do not know how to deal with it. Now, you see different nation states uh, approaching it differently. I mean, China is way ahead of everybody else. A lot of people in the West don't realize this, but starting in 2010, China began to very aggressively decarbonize the Chinese economy. Now, they were at that time just about to become the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, which, which they are now. They knew that. That was just the momentum of the system. Everybody knew that was about to happen. But they have been on a 
track to reduce the carbon intensity of the Chinese economy 40 to 45 percent this decade. That was their target set in 2010 for 2020. I believe the next range of goals that will be set in China will be to achieve uh, something close to carbon neutrality, zero net emissions by 2030. It's an extraordinary historic accomplishment. By and large, most people in the West aren't even paying attention. Again, because we, we don't know how to focus on the issues that really matter. And nothing matters really more at a global scale right now other than the destabilization of global climate along with the destruction of the oceans and ecosystems. Because when all is said and done, the systems that matter most, obviously, are the ecological ones. Um, but we have that kind of backwards, by and large. It's not where our attention is because we're very far removed from the natural order. So um, those are the, the kind of focal points. I mean, it's all about learning. You can see climate change is a global learning challenge. Um, and, you know, it's, again, it's not just individual. It is individual, but of course, what it really is is collective. So that, um, I would say that's, that's the huge challenge. Now, the collective that we've tried to focus on, again, you know, I've always been a very practical person. So if you look at the history of our work, it really was about teams and organizations. Because you can't really talk about changing the culture of an organization in the abstract. It comes down to how teams work from the management team down to product development teams. You know, the, the fundamental collective learning unit in organizations are teams and networks. You know, quote, organizations as a whole don't learn. An organization is an abstraction. But, you know, teams are not abstractions and networks are where people influence each other and build larger uh, collaborative uh, arrangements across boundaries. Um, those are not abstractions at all. So that was always where our work focused on the level of teams and larger networks and gradually uh, networks that cross the boundaries between different organizations. In 2002 to 2004, we spent two years organizing what became the Global Sustainable Food Laboratory. And the idea was to get a, a meaningful cross section of the world's largest food companies and NGOs, uh, social justice as well as environmental NGOs working together to really bring about fundamental shifts in the global food system. So that the vision has always been that sustainable agriculture become the mainstream system. Um, and everybody knew this would take many, many decades. It's just not gonna happen quickly. So uh, that's always been the focus is this the collective learning, but you can't have collective learning without individual learning. So the individual is always embedded within those teams and larger networks. So it's, it's really always both, but, but the important thing is to appreciate that nothing really changes until there's significant shifts in the institutional milieu that, shape, that shapes how our societies work. I read as well that you speak a lot about learning disabilities, so the habits and mindsets, and one that particularly stood up uh, from my perspective is the delusion of learning from experience. Could you maybe explain us a little bit more about this delusion? Sure. Well, at one level, learning from experience is how we learn, right? You learn to walk by falling down a lot, right? You learn to ride a bicycle by getting on your bicycle and you fall off it. So in that sense, learning from experience is essential. Mm -hmm. The problem comes when you deal with truly complex issues. Um, probably the, the mo most uh, uh, useful and uh, compelling definition vision of complexity is when cause and effect are no longer close in time and space. So just we, we even know this challenge at the individual level. So we learn to ride bicycles mm -hmm. because the, feed, the feedback from not having the correct balance is very quick. And of course, it's very, it's unambiguous, right? You yeah. fall off the bicycle. But imagine that instead of learning quickly and unambiguously, you made a mistake fall, riding your bicycle, but the feedback came the next day. Yeah. It'll be a totally different process. That's a little bit more what it's like in the world of relationships. You know, even as children, we start to encounter these challenges. We say something or do something that hurts a friend's feeling. She or he maybe doesn't say anything right then, or they say something that we don't really understand. But the next day, they're not very nice to us. 
and we don't understand why they're not nice to us. It's yeah. hard for us to connect our actions and the consequences. So another way to say learning from experience is learning from experience only works when you can make a connection between action and consequence. Once the time delays get too long or the consequences are somewhere distant from the action, our ability to learn from experience deteriorates rapidly. Hence the challenge of learning collectively about complex social dynamics, whether it's a team or it's climate change, because they're embedded in truly complex systems where cause and effect are simply not close. So that's what's meant by the, uh, the inability or the learning from experience. On the one hand, we have to learn from experience. On the other hand, we can't learn from experience around the most important issues. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. And, and what about the myth of the management team? I'm so curious because all of those learning disabilities, they seem at first as so logical, like obviously we learn from experiences and then I read, oh, that's actually delusion. And the same is the myth of the, of the management team. So what is this one about? Well, we use the term management team very loosely. We use the word team, whether it's management team or again, our product development team or sales team. You know, one of the big shifts, I would say, in the world of management in the last two or three decades has been now in most all companies, certainly most all larger companies, people work in teams. Mm -hmm. That was not the case. You know, the traditional hierarchical organization was, you know, your job was to please your boss, period, end of story. Mm -hmm. And while that's still true in many organizations and many cultures and many settings, gradually in more, let's just call them contemporary organizations, you know, people work in teams. So, so what's a team? Well, a bunch of people who are somehow are accountable for some outcomes, right? Whether they're sales targets or organizational goals. Um, but if you look at areas where we know a little bit about teams, uh, let's take sports or the performing arts, we don't use the word team in the performing arts very much. We would use probably more in English the word ensemble. But believe me, a dance ensemble, a theater acting ensemble is a team. Anybody who's ever been in that setting will tell you it's not about how brilliant I am, it's how brilliant we are. And of course, the exact same thing is true in sports. So if you look at domains where we know something about teams, sports or the performing arts particularly, um, we know that a team is not just a bunch of people on the stage together <laughs> or a bunch of people on the athletic field together. You know, if that were the case, there'd be no such thing as coaching or development. I mean, how teams learn to play together is, is extraordinarily complex mm -hmm. uh, and, and high skill domain. It's in that same sense that if we just call a team a team, like a management team a team, because we say, well, you guys, you're all working together and you're all now collectively accountable for how the organization does. You know, that's a management team. And of course, you have responsibilities in marketing and development and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, calling a group a team and assuming that that makes them a team is really naive. It would be literally like putting a bunch of us on the soccer field or football field together and say, you're now a team. So we would laugh at that because it's so ludicrous. We understand that even, even in very high uh, uh, levels of skill, you can have a lot of very skillful athletes individually who make a very poor team. So we understand this, again, in these domains like performing arts and sports, but oftentimes we, we pay no attention to it in a meaningful way in the world of management. But it's just as important, you know, for example, um, a team is supposed to be able to think through very difficult, complex issues, mm -hmm. issues where there are legitimately different points of view and maybe even some fairly strong conflicts. You believe this, I believe this. Do you think our problem is our product is too out of date and the technology platform is no longer up to date? I believe our problem is we're out of touch with our customers, whatever. There are any team, any group, any family you know, encounters this reality of legitimately different points of view. We see different parts of reality. We have different priorities, maybe even different values. Yeah. How does a team learn to be good at talking through complex issues when there are legitimate differences? This is a very high skill area. It takes real effort to build that capability, very much analogously, again, to a bunch of really good athletes who have to learn how to to, to make plays together and how to offset each other's strengths. 
So I, I think that's what I mean by the myth of the management team. Just because we call them a team doesn't make them a team team. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And one thing that that stood out to me is one of the disciplines from your fifth discipline book. And um, that's team learning. And you said that it's based on a dialogue or it starts with the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And from my perception and from my experience working for big corporates, for smaller companies, often people somehow say, I don't have time. I am stressed. I don't have you time said. to even talk. So that's from right. your experience, how do the right teams that are really effective in working together, together as one team towards one mission, what do they do about stress or dealing with stress? Well, you won't do anything until it's important enough. I mean, th this is where that fatalism I was referring to before comes into play. Yeah. People go, well, I've been on lots of teams and they're usually pretty crappy and we all have to do it because that's the way we do things nowadays. But, you know, usually people don't really listen to each other. They're busy playing on their gadgets when they're supposed to be having a meeting. We go to a big meeting and it's, everybody looks at each other's PowerPoint slides. You know, it's a, pretty much a waste of time. I mean, imagine this. Imagine every meeting was voluntary. Yeah. Who would show up? Okay? So that, that just points out that we're, we're really, we don't believe it can be better. So of course it won't be better, yeah. you know, self-fulfilling prophecies. Yeah. So m what I've seen again and again as a kind of big part of my own personal learning has been the opportunity to work with people I would consider really masterful managers. People who have a very, very high skill levels. And without exception, one of the domains in which they have a lot of skill is how to build effective teams. Because they know if you can't build an effective team, it's really hard to build an effective organization. Mm -hmm. One of the things they invariably do is say, we're going to take this amount of time. And that can be done in a lot of ways. I remember many, many years ago talking to a guy who had founded a, what became a very, very successful magazine. And he said, the first big stage we, we went through is that we had a weekly editorial meeting. So all the editors get together and, you know, they, they talk about what they're working on. And, of course, they always talk about the business conditions and all that. It was like a two-hour meeting every Friday. He said, the first significant step we made is we made it three hours. But the last hour was not about the business or the editing or the articles. It was about reflecting how the first two hours had gone. Nice. Ah. That was it. He added one hour to his weekly staff meeting. That was it. And he said, all of a sudden, people could say, well, you know, I don't really think they'll listen to Fred when he said that, or that Jane was really distracted. And, you know, they could reflect on the quality of the conversation they just had. So reflection is a terribly important process, which by and large has been a blind spot in, I would say, our Western cultures for a very, very long time. Yeah. And, and now in the intensity, in the high stress level of contemporary organizations, it's virtually invisible. Uh, but there's an old saying, it's only through reflection that you change your history. Yeah. Because we do, we do what we do habitually because that's what we've done. That's true of individuals, that's true of organizations. Why is a team meeting the way it is? Well, it's the way it's always been. Nobody ever pays attention, et cetera, whatever. So there's individual <laughs> habits and there's collective habits. None of those habits will ever change until we at least see them. We all know this at the personal level. It's just as true at the collective level. No habit, changing habits is hard work, but habits will never change if we don't even see the habit. First, we have to see, oh yeah, that's kind of the way I always act in this situation. And then of course we have to see, but I guess my actions are a little bit problematic. I guess they're really keeping me or us from accomplishing things we want. At that point, you have the beginnings of a learning process. You've identified through your reflection some aspect of the way you're operating today it's not adequate. This is it's trivial in one sense. You know, when I describe it the way I describe it now, you know, it's kind of, kind of self-evident. People do what they do because that's what they've done until they hit a moment. They go, holy cow, what I've always done isn't really working. <laughs> <laughs> so it I, isn't the end of the learning process, but without that, there's no beginning of a learning process. So, so reflection is terribly crucial. And, and reflection takes time. 
it doesn't necessarily take a lot of time. And the real irony here is that initially people say, we don't have time, we don't have time, we don't have time. I think what they really are saying is we don't know how. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because when you get better at it, you can do it more and more efficiently. You can have a reflective conversation in five minutes. You know, you've been talking to somebody or and all of a sudden you stop and say, no, wait a second. Maybe we're making an assumption here that doesn't make sense. And rather than just arguing, let's kind of talk about our assumptions. And if you're skillful at that and you've done it a lot, in five minutes, all of a sudden the conversation shifts. Ultimately, it's not about time, but initially it's definitely about time. If you don't set aside the time to start to create some reflective space in any working environment, then you, you can be quite sure that habit will be the dominating force. Yeah, and it, I see immediately the connection to one of the uh, 11 laws that are coming uh, from the same book and that there is no blame. How I understand it is that we want to take responsibility for our reality, so, um, uh, so do I say. That being said, we want to be proactive, namely we want to proactively reflect on what happened and make changes in, uh, in our future decisions. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. And, you know, blame and guilt are two sides of the same coin. <laughs> because they both, what they do, if you step back and think about them, what they're doing is you have a situation where something's not working. Mm -hmm. Let's just say it's a pretty complicated situation. There are different people involved and, and you're attributing causality to individuals. Mm -hmm. The individual could be somebody else. That's called blame. Well, she screwed up. Or it could be me. Well, I screwed up. And while there may be some truth to that at some level, it very rarely tells us enough to know what to do differently. Because the reasons I screwed up may have a lot to do with what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. If there's a collective causal element to it, you'll never discover that through blame and guilt or shaming and blaming. So we always find teams that get good at this sort of thing, that they recognize that. They say, okay, well, look, that we, you know, what are the what are the attributions we're making about how I screwed up or somebody else? But great, fine. Let's just acknowledge those. And now, what's deeper? What are the deeper sources? You know, if somebody else was in my job, it may very well be that they would make the same mistake, because we don't have the information we need, or we're all operating under the pressures of certain metrics that force us to take a very short-term, very fragmented view. And yeah. somebody else is in my job, they're going to make the same mistakes. So then we're starting to inquire, we always use the metaphor deeper into the iceberg at the deeper levels of the structural or systemic sources of problems. It doesn't mean that individuals don't have responsibility. Of course we do. It just means that that individualistic lens is not enough. Yeah. And now I would also say from my experience that blame or kill, they somehow paralyze you and they don't really allow you then to, to actually really learn. You're too obsessed with yourself or with other people. Exactly. That's exactly correct. You know, they, they paralyze us emotionally. Yeah. We feel angry. We're upset that somebody else is upset at us or we're upset about somebody. So we get in the jargon of the emotional literacy world today, we get emotionally hijacked. Right. And, and so that's why emotional intelligence is such an important part of all this, that, you know, how we kind of let our emotions be what they are, particularly the problematic emotions, the blame, the anger, the guilt, all those things, mm -hmm. but, but not let them shape our thinking and acting. Just, just let them be. You know, emotions are a very important part of life. And we know now from, you know, contemporary neuroscience that emotions operate much more quickly. Yeah. So, you know, like roughly 20 times as fast, we have an emotional response, actually literally physically, it's a physical response mm -hmm. that we then also feel at the, uh, at the feeling level. So our stomach is tight, our neck muscles are tight, and we're angry. But that <laughs> happens, that literally happens in, in, in fractions of a second in a complex situation. It takes a little longer to have some clear thoughts. So the frontal lobe part of our, of our brain, it works, it's very important, but it takes a little time. That's again, why spaces for reflection are very important. And developing the ability to acknowledge and allow the emotions to be present, but then not to allow them to dominate. I mean, 
it's ironic, you know, you make all these really big decisions in business, you know, mm-hmm. literally big in the sense of, you know, many, many, much financial resources at stake and, and many people at stake. And we make them in states of emotional hijack. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's hilarious. And people are, you know, they fly around the world, they make a decision in an hour, then they fly back, they're exhausted, you know, I yeah. mean, and, and they're being paid, you know, ridiculous amounts of money to make really bad decisions. Yeah. But they're caught up, they're caught up in a culture, a deeper, you know, deeper in the iceberg, a deeper set of norms and assumptions, like we don't have time. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's really crazy. I mean, it really, if you think about that statement, we don't have time. It's totally crazy. We all have the same amount of time. Time is not the issue, right? <laughs> it's, <laughs> no, it's a totally meaningless statement. We all have the exact same amount of time. So I think it's really a, um, a shorthand for we don't know how. We don't know how to reflect. We're, we're worried that we've got a lot to do and we don't have the time in the sense that if we take a little time to really organize a more dialogic or reflective conversation, it'll, it won't work. It'll be a, quote, waste of time. So it's really not a statement about time at all. It's shorthand for a statement about competency and values. One, one link that we tend to make yeah, when people say, I don't have time, we have a similar response typically. And we relate it to priorities, saying your yeah. issue isn't time, it's priorities. And yeah. your number one priority is to be in a positive emotional state. Because exactly. any other state would cloud your judgment, create right. poor decisions, and right. so a poor future yeah. situation. And again, and this yeah. is based yeah. on, on being self-aware and reflect you won't be self-aware unless you reflect and that leads me obviously to the fifth disciplines so for those people peter who are completely unaware of your masterpiece could you please walk us through five uh, disciplines that you define in your book uh, and i would say they are all based on uh, self-reflection <laughs> well so reflection is an integrating element you're absolutely right uh, through all of them i mean personal mastery has a lot to do with my kind of, let's say, being centered in myself, what really matters to me, you know, some clarity of my own personal vision, my own personal values, and, and the willingness to look at those kind of shortcomings, mm-hmm. uh, what we often call creative tension, gaps between my vision and reality, which is, if you think about it, is what we were saying before about learning. All learning is driven by vision, real learning. At one point in your life, you had a vision of riding a bicycle. And you had the reality of falling off. <laughs> so if you couldn't deal with that gap, guess what? You're never going to learn to ride a bicycle. So yeah. at some level, that gap between my vision and reality is, is fundamental to human existence. It's always the case of a learning process. And how we build the capacity individually to deal with those gaps is really at the heart of the dif- discipline of personal mastery. Uh, the discipline of mental models is also a personal discipline. And it really has to do with everything we're saying about reflection. The term mental models is a jargon term that we kind of picked up many, many, many years ago from a uh, Dutch or Dutch and English company named Shell, who had transformed their planning process many years ago to being a process of reflection on mental models. They used to say, well, everybody makes plans, but the the plans themselves never turn out to be the actual reality. The real question is, does the planning process give managers an opportunity to reflect, to nice. see their own assumptions, because those are the dangers. It's not that our plans are wrong. We know our plans. They're always wrong. But if they're based on invisible assumptions that we've never identified, then we don't know why they're wrong. Then we can't learn. So that was what the discipline of mental models was all about, was really mm-hmm. that commitment at the personal level to um, reflection. Now, when you make that collective, you have the discipline of team learning. And of course, as I was saying before, the real learning processes are always individual and collective, because you or I as individuals learning in an organization really is not going to make that much difference, even if we're the CEO. Because since almost all key decisions are made to some degree collectively in teams, uh, you really got to have teams learning how to reflect, teams learning how to deal with gaps between reality and their vision, teams learning how to surface their own hidden assumptions, particularly their collective assumptions, like we don't have time 
or this is the way business is right now. To be successful in business, you have to move fast. That's a great assumption. But it's an assumption. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's an assumption everybody shares. Or, you know, to be an effective business, nobody has time. I mean, those are examples of collective assumptions. So how do people collectively learn to reflect on the assumptions that are serving and those that are inhibiting them? And then if you go back to the personal vision part of personal mastery, the visions that really matter likewise are collective, not just personal. So that has to do with the discipline of building shared vision. Uh, how do we collectively start to clarify what we, not just I, seek to create? Uh, and it's all uh, bound together by the, the, the fifth discipline, which is called systems thinking, because what, what really makes all of this critical in today's world is what I said at the beginning. You know, we, we live in a world of extraordinary interconnectedness. And by and large, we do not know how to understand that interconnectedness. We find ourselves just reacting to things, not really understanding them. Um, and at the individual, organizational, and societal level, this gap between the complexity of our world and our ability to understand complexity is literally putting our survival at risk. Mm -hmm. So that's the fifth discipline, systems yeah. thinking. Yeah, that's a very big underlying assumption is that we are separated or that right. departments within a company are separated or that organizations are separated of each other whereas everything is part of one bigger system so overlooking that critical fact causes an entire chain of poor decisions yeah. that exactly. create damage everywhere we see exactly that's exactly right so that's why it's like the the underpinning kind of, you might say, conceptual discipline. So how do we understand interconnectedness? And, you know, you can say, well, life, the world is infinitely interconnected. So that means nothing. Well, it's true. I mean, it's, it's hopelessly complex. But you start wherever you start. You know, so if you're in an organization, you start to look at where the obvious disconnects are. We have great product ideas, but we're really out of touch with our customers. Mm -hmm. There's a real disconnection between marketing and product development. I mean, I'm just using this to illustrate now. So, so it's not that you have to figure out all the interconnectedness in the universe. You know, <laughs> we're never going to do that. <laughs> uh, but, but you look at where there are critical fragmentations, and it, very often they're just in a team. These two people, they just do not listen to each other. So that's a critical fragmentation. Or these two departments, they've been separated and fragmented for so long, and yet they're crucial, learning to learn how to work together. So you start wherever the most critical disconnections are and start to address those. You, you're never going to address all the fragmentation. Yeah, there is just one word that suddenly pops in front of my eyes, and that's ego. Because working together means leave your ego aside. So I'm interested, Peter, how do you deal with people who have a very strong and present egos? You mean like all of us? Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And there are some of us who are even Except less aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so, you know, first off, you have to start with, you know, some simple statements about re reality as, as best we know it. If we have a body, we probably have an ego. And since most of us are embodied, I don't think we, we worry about not having egos. Um, and so it's not about you know ego or no ego. It's about ways in which I get tangled up mm -hmm. in my own. Usually, this is where the emotions are really important. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having an ego. There's nothing wrong with being egotistical. We're individuals. Of course, we see things from our point of view. Of course, we have our own interests in mind. Of course, of course, of course. The problem is we get caught up. I mean, so here's a, here's a, a very simple kind of uh, paradox. Human beings are individuals, but we're also social. Why does the social media work? Well, the social media works because companies like Facebook have learned to exploit the social tendencies particularly of teenagers. Mm -hmm. As teenagers, when we're at that critical stage in our development where other people's views of us really start to matter, right? When you're seven or eight years old, it matters a little. But when you're 13 to 15 years old, it matters a lot. Yeah. Because you're starting to be, develop a social identity that's very critical to your identity. And so it's not coincidental the social media companies always want to get people hooked on their platform by the age of 11 or 12 or 13. So that's just a reflection on our social nature. 
So human beings are both individual and social. And I don't think that's a trivial statement at all. And I don't think that's a cultural statement. I do not believe this species would have evolved without our social intelligence. You think about it. We're not particularly fast. We're not particularly strong. What allowed the species to emerge? Well, I think in the end, we're quite good at working together. Yeah. yeah. You know, the village, the tribe, what have you, every, you know, or the history of humanness is a history of social intelligence and social relations. So there's the paradox. We're individuals and we're social. And I think we have to embrace that paradox mm -hmm. because it's, it's a long way around to come back to your question. I don't think there's much point in trying to reduce the ego. I think there's a lot of point in trying to cultivate relational intelligence. Oh. Ego is not the problem. It's the imbalanced ego. It's when I forget that I really care about you. It's when I forget that I actually do, not because someone told me to, but I actually do care about your well-being. I mean, I, this is not a state, an ideological statement. This is a, a biological statement. We, you know, one of my mentors, a very famous Chilean biologist named Humberto Maturana, it's a Maturan with an M, M-A-T-U-R-A-N-A. -A. He's quite famous in Chile and quite famous in biology, but if you're not a biologist, you're not Chilean, you've probably never heard of him. But he's, he's one of the great scientists of the, of the second half of the 20th century, really literally an Einstein-like figure in biology. Humberto always starts off by saying, we are loving animals. Nice. Biologically speaking, we are loving animals. And so the problem is not ego. The problem is we've forgotten how to connect with each other. And we're often operating in work environments that so reinforce that individualism that they don't pay enough attention to the collective or the social. That's why we've always emphasized teams so much. Because it's really in working teams that we learn how to strike a better balance between my interests and your interests, between my way of seeing things and your way of seeing things, between my success and our success. Mm -hmm. So I think fighting the ego is a very low leverage strategy. I think cultivating, cultivating relational intelligence is much higher leverage. The, I, I love that point yeah. of view. Uh, focus on the social aspects, on the teamwork, all of that. And we've been thinking about that a lot for ourselves as well. We have, both Lenka and I, we have a history in large corporates and also in smaller companies. Now we're running our own business. And what we found to be the weakest link for ourselves and for the people we work with is stress. We decided to fight stress and point everyone's attention to the importance of first and foremost be stress-free and thereby free up your creative bandwidth, your mental capacities yeah. to actually listen to somebody else <laughs> and take some time to reflect yeah. and maybe ask yourself some questions that you normally yeah. don't ask yourself. It's all about awareness, right? Yeah. Our conversation has been the most zoomed out interview that we've done so far. Yeah, absolutely. Looking at this entire system that we live in from a distance instead of from an inside point of view. And if we can only help individuals raise their level of awareness, open the door to seeing these new things, then one by one, yeah. we will create this ripple effect. Now, the difficulty with awareness is that where you are, from the point where you are, it's hard to realize that there is a next level. So what have you found to be a trigger point or a reason for somebody to open their minds to a completely new way of doing things? Well, there's probably two types of pathways. Uh, the first is breakdown. Mm -hmm. You know, we all know, and we've often experienced times in our life when things really fall apart. Yeah. And we, we, we awaken, you might say. We realize that, you know, just trying harder is not going to solve this problem. Doing what I've done habitually is actually contributed to the problem. And these are painful moments, right? So, but they're the, they're the, the moments of, of real breakdown and, and potentially breakthrough. The other, I think, is more uh, aspirational. And I think both, because life is complicated, I think both coexist. I, 
I think the idea of living a life that'll never have breakdowns, it'll never have tragedies, it'll never have things that happen that are the worst thing we could ever imagine happening to us is pretty naive. That's going to happen. Um, on the other hand, cultivating the ability to pay attention, cultivating some stability of mind, cultivating some awareness of your awareness, all the kind of cornerstones, you might say, of the, of the traditional cultivation uh, disciplines, West and East, you know, because they, they exist in all cultures. And of course, they exist way before modern times. They're very well embedded in native cultures. That is a, is a little different path. That's the path of, of continually cultivating the self at the, at the deepest levels, not just the ego self, but the kind of self that generates awareness. I think they're both paths. I think they're ultimately very complementary. Um, I think most people's moments of awakening are brought about by crisis. Just like you know, if you ask a lot of people in business, you know, when do things really change? Oh, they say, well, they change if there's a real crisis. Well, that's true, but it's an unfortunate change theory because it condemns us to living you know, from a crisis to the next crisis to the next crisis. Uh, so I think it's one of those things that's, that's, that's really part of life, but it's not exactly very aspirational. You know, another way to kind of pose the question is, what would it be like to be able to continually grow and develop because that's your aspiration, to continually grow and develop? You know, I think, again, we see lots of examples of this. This might sound romantic, but I don't think it is. Look at all kinds of professions where people grow their whole lives. You know, that they, they love what they do, and they get better and better and better at it throughout their life. Uh, Strata. Various made his greatest violins were his last violins, and he was 90 years old. There's so many examples like that where, where an individual is really dedicated to something, it's, has this passion that never goes away, and they spend their life getting better at it. That's change driven by aspiration, not desperation. So they're both important, aspiration and desperation, but the tragedy is we come to depend way too much on desperation. I think the desperation part of your explanation is linked directly to the trend we see with uh, all the burnouts around us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. in the Netherlands, uh, one in seven um, professionals mm -hmm. enters the doctor's office with burnout symptoms. One yeah. in seven, that's over a million professionals. And what yeah. you often hear is that people who recover from burnout, looking back, call it the best thing that ever happened to exactly. them. Exactly. Yeah, that's the... That's the breakdown or crisis path. Um, by the way, that statistic is not nearly as high as you th think it might be. If you look at medicine, mm -hmm. the number one issue in hospitals today amongst the, the professionals, the doctors especially, and the nurses almost equally, is, is what they call stress-related burnout. And the conventional estimate today, because I was talking to someone in one of the biggest hospitals in Boston the other day, she said this is the number one issue in the entire uh, uh, industry today, the conventional estimate is 40 to 50% of doctors and nurses are chronically burned out. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yes. Okay. Question. Very important. What do you think is the cause of that stress? Because people say stress means I have too much to do, not enough time. I know. Back to what our <laughs> earlier conversation, right? I, I, think, I think that's a cop out. Look at <laughs> We've all worked really hard and then taken a nice long weekend or a two week hike in the mountains and we come back and we're fine, right? Hard work does not produce stress. Hard work produces tiredness, right? Yeah. That's a very natural thing. It's, it's different. Stress is a deeper psychological, emotional condition. It gets associated with working hard, but I think it has to do with one, feeling out of control, so in other words, I'm working really hard, but it's because I have no choice. And so many things are being thrown at me, I can't do anything about it. That's that fatalism I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. That feeling of I don't have efficacy. The second is I've lost a sense of meaning or purpose. I'm doing this because this is what I'm supposed to do, or this is what my job requires, or I, I really, this is a crappy job, but I, I'm stuck with it, right? So that sense of fatalism, being trapped, and losing purpose, to me, are much closer to the deeper sources of stress. 
And then, of course, we can say, well, maybe part of it really is uh, epidemic. Mm -hmm. You know, what distinguishes a disease from an epidemic is an epidemic has larger collective causes, right? Systemic causes. Yeah. I would say we live in an epidemic of stress because by and large in our societies, we have this condition of fatalism and loss of purpose. We really don't know what we're doing. Yeah. We, think, we think our society's purpose is to grow GDP. It's crazy. I mean, literally crazy. <laughs> Almost no one even knows how it's calculated. I mean, this is insanity. We, we think our goals are things we don't even know what they are. But if we don't achieve them, we feel very anxious. So um, I'd say this loss of purposefulness and this feeling of fatalism is an epidemic. So yes, I do think there, you have to look at this at the individual level, of course, and the team and the organization. Mm -hmm. But we, I think there's good reason to say that our societies are totally off course today. And we live in, an, in, an, in the conditions of an epidemic of stress. I mean, the World Health Organization says that, all but says that, you know, you know that three times as many people in the world kill themselves or die from stress-related diseases as from all forms of warfare and homicide. In other words, three times as many people die at their own hands versus the hands of others. Wow. Unnecessarily. That's not dying of old age or disease-related to old age. That's the World Health Organization. Um, so um, this is a global problem. This stress and anxiety stuff is, is really a global problem. And I think it's because our societies are lost. Yeah, yeah, and we don't recognize that we're stressed, or most people, because it's all we know. It's like fish don't recognize they swim in the water. Exactly, exactly. If that's all there is, that's all there is. Yeah. yeah. Until, until you meet somebody who's actually living a life well, and you go, wait a second, must be something screwy about that person. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're very woo-woo. <laughs> exactly but Peter we want to be respectful of your time so we, we're going to have to close this conversation and I want to thank you for sharing all your wisdom and there were several moments in this conversation where I actually felt goosebumps, goosebumps. Yeah. Um, in the moment where you stated these bigger truths that are simply not being brought to the surface so often now as a very short last question <laughs> I I want to ask you something on behalf of our audience. And these are all people that are into personal development, that want to grow, that want to make better decisions, you know? And Eli Goldratt said, management attention is the number one bottleneck in organizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend? Which one best tip do you have for the individuals on the individual level to work with their attention in a smarter way? Which habit? Can they adopt as of today to improve on that? Well, I'm not sure it's a habit, but it is a simple action. And it may be one that has already been taken. Um, I mean, if we accept the premise that these are epistemic or, you know, societal problems, not just individual, not just organization, then the odds of us as individuals being able to effectively combat them are relatively low. I do think the changes are individual at some level, but you need partners. So my advice is very simple. Make sure you have a few partners. If I'm in a team, make sure there's at least one or two other people in that team who care about what I care about, you know, and we can sit down and, and have a little bit of a, of a kind of an alliance. Um, these are really deep and difficult issues, you know, and to try to think I'm, I'm unique, unilaterally responsible for bringing about change is delusional. So uh, I think my one of my greatest benefits I've always think in my life is I've always had great partners to work with. So that's a simple thing. And maybe you've already got that. And if you do, spend, make sure you're spending enough time reflecting together with whoever those partners are. I love that. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your wisdom. For the people listening to this interview who want to find out more about you, about your messages, um, about your wisdom, where can they go? Well, I thought about that a little bit beforehand. Um, there's, a, there's one really web-based community that we're all very close to. It's the Presencing Institute. 
communities. So the, the, the Presencing Institute, you can just Google Presencing, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-I-N-G. It's a, it's actually a word that Otto Scharmer made up. Uh, but uh, that's, a, that's a very vibrant, very large, very globally extended uh, learning community. And there's lots of ways to participate online there. We've been much more focused on smaller communities embedded in different settings. So other than the books, um, uh, a website that has pretty good resources is the Academy for System Change uh, and the, what's called the Interactive Field Book. A lot of the tools and methods that we use are there, all there online. And that's a, a collaboration with the Amidier Network, people who are the eBay family. <laughs> um, so if you just Google uh, Academy for System Change, uh, you'll find that. Um, and then the Presencing Institute as a, as a very large, vibrant online community. Those are, those are both resources and places you can plug in with others. Amazing. We're going to make sure that we post the direct links Thank you. to these places uh, with the interview in the show notes. And one more time, Peter, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Brilliant. Happy to hear that. I wish you thank a you. wonderful day. Thank you. You too. Wow. This has probably been the most zoomed out interview that we've had so far. You heard Peter. To stay connected and be inspired by the work of him and his network, there are two places you want to go to and make sure you enroll for their newsletters so that you stay connected. First, find the Presencing Institute on Presencing org and second go to academy for systemic change on academy for change.org in our conversation it was once again highlighted why being stress-free is every leader's number one priority and for this reason our management coaching organization earn more work less will soon provide a free three-part online masterclass on our how to work stress-free methodology We'll give away the very best ingredients of our methodology. Our students, they call it life changing and some believe that every knowledge worker in the world benefits from learning this simple method. So do you want to become a stress-free leader? Do you want to participate together with your colleagues? And do you want to promote our free masterclass to your network? Then right now go to earnmoreworkless.com slash stress-free masterclass and then roll for this unique one-time free course do it now because there are limited seats available we also give away an awesome bonus when you enroll right now so go to the page to find out what that is thanks again for joining us on the influential executive podcast we love hearing your feedback so please right now let us know your thoughts in the comments or send us an email we are sending you much love from Amsterdam. Have a fun and successful week and let's all go out, work together as a team and have fun.